I want to, before we get into the sermon today, where's my boys basketball team from Lee Park Prep? If you're a boys basketball player from Lee Park Prep, I want you to come up onto the stage. Come on up. And that's time change Sunday, so I hope you guys showed up to church. Look at you. Here we go. Here we go. Here they come. As they make their way up, I want to show you why I wasn't here last week. We went with the prep boys and girls basketball teams to uh, Ohio, Mount Vernon, Ohio, for the NCSAA uh, National Championships. We had devotions every day with our kids because we're a Christian school. And uh, we did mission work at a nearby church, Dayspring Church, let us use their gym for a practice day. And so while we were there, we did some mission work there. Our boys and our girls teams were involved in, in, in doing nice things at the church. Our girls basketball team, that's a, their uh, last game of the tournament that they won. That was awesome. And then the boys basketball team, well, they did okay too. They won every game they played and they beat teams from around the country and they brought home that, the basketball championships, boys varsity division five first place. How about that? Woo! Coach Jason's here today. Where's Coach Tommy? Does he hate church all of a sudden? Where is he? I think he's laughing over there. Where is he? Well, come on up, Tommy. Oh, good grief. The segment could have been over by now if you would have come up when you were. So I guess when he gets up here, we should give a standing ovation to the coach actually made it up onto the stage. Because where would we be without Coach Tommy? It's about the boys, yeah, and you're one of the boys. Come on, now why don't you let's let them stand up and let them know that you're happy they went and won that tournament. How about the boys? <laughs> All right. And uh, Brock's going to go ahead and start the sermon out for us. Brock, go right ahead. Well. <laughs> hey, I love you guys. Congratulations. Congratulations. What a great year it's been. And now go sit down, open your Bibles up. Let's get to work, all right? Man, that's really cool, man. We've, we're only three years old as a school. We've won state championships and now a national tournament. And, uh, and, and it's, they're good kids, man. I'm, I'm just happy to be around good kids. They're good kids. And I'm thankful for them. And I'm thankful my son, Ty, he's a senior this year. So that was kind of a neat thing uh, to go out on and go see him play. And, and I'm thankful for Pastor Drew. Man, I'm thankful for him to come in and preach the way he did and with such boldness and confidence. And a couple of years ago, he was sitting out where you guys were, and then God called him to ministry. And then he went, we sent, we sent a group of people to Anderson Grove, and he went, and then he was ordained into ministry. And he's the campus pastor there at Anderson Grove. He's also helping with one of our other church family churches at Community Baptist Church. And then he, he gets to preach some too, and the way he came and preached and loved it. And I gotta tell you something, he loved, he loved preaching to all the services here, but he really loved the 11 o'clock service, and here's why. Because you amened him. You amened him. So I was watching him, and I'm like, yeah, you talk back to him. And see, that's preacher gold right there. When you let him know, you let him know you're awake. You know, they love it. And I remember the first time I was ever preaching a sermon and someone said amen, I stopped and thanked them because I didn't know what to do. So I said, right, no, no, amen. Oh, thank you. And then I went back and kept preaching. You're not supposed to do that. So Drew said he started preaching 11 o'clock service. There's a couple of amens. He's like, I didn't know what to do. He said, I got all tongue-tied. I was so excited that someone said amen. So that's good. That's very good. And I just got done uh, preaching at Anderson Grove, and Pastor Drew was back there with his people. And we had new people there today. The church is doing well. And so the church family model is alive and well, and I'm thankful for that. Over the last few weeks, we've been talking about miracles and doubt. And it's been a pretty consistent refrain Christ does the miracles and the people doubt. Even his followers doubt. Well, today as we get to Mark chapter 6, starting in verse 7, it shifts a little bit. Now the call from Christ is for his followers to go out and do the miracles. Well, now that would cause some probably internal doubt. How are we going to do what he did? Now Christ has prepared them for this moment and now he sends them out. They've been taught by Christ himself. Now they're going to have to overcome their own doubt and advance the faith over doubt. That's what I want you to see today, advancing the faith over doubt. Let's stand, all right? We'll honor the reading of God's Word. Mark chapter 6, starting in verse 7. This is what the Bible says. And he summoned the twelve and began to send them out in pairs. He gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He instructed them that they should take nothing for their journey except a mere staff, no bread, no bag, no money, in their belt, but to wear sandals. And, and he added, don't, don't put on two tunics, only take one shirt. 
Then he said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave town. Any place that doesn't receive you or listen to you as you go out from there, shake the dust off the soles of your feet for a testimony against them. And they went out and they preached that men should repent. And they were casting out many demons and were anointing with oil many sick people and they were healing them. Let's pray. God, thank you for this truth. Thank you for our time together. Thank you for the opportunity we've already had to worship and then to dedicate a beautiful baby boy back to you. God, you are good and we are thankful for you. We pray to you and praise you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. There's a book John MacArthur wrote. It's a little book, not very big, and I love it. It's called 12 Ordinary Men. The idea is that Christ, from all the followers he had, later he will send a group of 70 of his followers out with the same sort of mission. But the first group he sends out is this group that he specifically sectioned off from the men and women who were following him. These 12 ordinary men called to do extraordinary things. Most of them fishermen, one a tax collector, ordinary-ish jobs. One was a zealot, so from all sorts of different walks of life, but now called in by Christ to be taught by Christ and then to be sent. The first thing we see in the text is that they are now called to advance the faith with authority. So if you think maybe you can't do great things in Jesus' name, you're just an ordinary person, well, watch what happens when these ordinary people get sent out. They advance the faith with authority. Now, this is not something that sprung on them. In fact, a few weeks ago, maybe months ago, we previewed this in Mark chapter 3. In Mark chapter 3, verse 14, the Bible says, Christ appointed the 12. Why? So that they would be with him. So he would have special opportunity to instruct them and teach them and train them. Then he could send them out to preach and have authority to cast out the demons. Now, that happened months and months and months and months before Mark chapter 6, maybe even a year before Mark chapter 6. Now, after this special teaching and training with Christ, they're sent out. The expectations are not low. The expectations are that they will cast out demons. Now, they've seen Christ do this. But now you talk about face-to-face -face with the enemy, with the authority and power to cast them out. Matthew's gospel tells this story and adds this. They were not just to cast out demons, but also heal the sick. Luke's gospel adds this. They, they were to cast out demons, heal the sick, and raise the dead. Well, my goodness. If they had any sort of doubts about what they saw Jesus do, and they saw him do all these things, including raise the dead. Now they're being asked to go out and cast out demons and heal sick people and raise the dead. Now how would you feel if you were asked to do these things? How would you feel if this was some expectation you had? How in the world would you do it? How could they do it? Well, verse 7 tells us how. They had the authority of Christ. He gave them the authority to cast out the demons. He gave them the authority to heal sick people. He even gave them the authority to raise the dead. Now you're probably not going to be asked to do that. The reason I know you're probably not going to be asked to do that is because in the New Testament, as Christ explains what we are to do, that's not, those aren't the things. This is specific and special apostolic power. Apostles, by the way, you notice they're called disciples a lot in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Mark actually gives us a preview of a new word later on when he calls them apostles. Apostle means to be sent with authority. Not their authority, the authority of Christ. Sent with the authority of Christ to do what Christ wants them to do. Well, what authority is he sending you in? What does he want from you? What does he expect from you? Does the Bible tell you what Jesus wants from you? Well, it does. Let me give you seven things that Christ wants from you and expects from you. Your job description will not seem nearly as difficult as the job description of these men, but it is equally powerful because it comes in the authority of Christ. Here's the first. Be born again. We see that in John chapter 3. You must be born again. You were born into sin. Now you must be born again into Christ. Redeemed by Christ, saved by Christ, by faith in Christ, you are now a new person. Those of you who have by faith come to Christ, you have been born again. You're new, you're different than you were, and the Holy Spirit indwells you. Something else the Bible tells us that we are to do and is expected from us to do, Matthew 23, Jesus says, here's a new command, that you love God. Matthew 23 says, and you love other people. 
You love people. You love God. The love of God was a part of something in the Old Testament. Love the Lord your God with all your mind, with all your body, with all your soul, with all your strength. Jesus says, and there's something else. Make sure you love one another. Here's something else that we're expected to do. In John chapter 17, as Jesus prays before going to the cross, he prays for his followers and prays specifically that they would live in unity. The body of Christ from people from different areas, different backgrounds, different histories, different walks of life, now come together united in Christ. No matter where you're from, no matter what your ethnicity, as a Christian, you're united into the body of Christ. And Christ, in John chapter 17, prayed in advance for what we're doing right now. Different people gathered together, unified in Christ. Something else he prayed for his people before going to the cross was this, that we would provide testimony Testimony to our faith in Christ, but he says also specifically this, testimony that because of our faith in Christ, people would see that Jesus is Lord. And then there's this, number six, to worship. He tells us how to pray. Here's how you communicate, Matthew chapter 11. Here's how you communicate with God. Here's how you begin this worship process. Here's how you count on him and how you see his holiness and honor his holiness. Then, of course, number seven is the one that we're very familiar with, and that is the Great Commission. We're to go make more disciples. And, and notice this. In the call before the ascension to go make more disciples, Jesus says this, I'll be with you even to the very end. That authority is not stopping. In fact, the Bible says that when you by faith come to Christ, the Holy Spirit indwells you. There's authority. There's power in that. These seven things that I've listed should be something you can do. The Holy Spirit indwells you. You have been born again, made new by Christ. So you love God and you love people and you live in unity with the body of Christ. That provides a testimony that Jesus is Lord and we worship him and go make more disciples. Yet something that Billy Graham said throughout his ministry was that very few Christians will actually complete one of the tasks, which is to share Christ with other people and see a conversion. Now, he does the saving. But very few Christians actually take the step to personally share Christ. Now think about that for a second. You're not asked to raise dead people. It wouldn't be on your authority anyway. It'd be on his. You're not asked to heal sick people. It wouldn't be on your authority. It'd be on his. You're not asked to cast out demons. It wouldn't be on your authority. It'd be on his. But the things in the New Testament that we are told to do, that doesn't look all that demanding. That looks like Christian living. Should be something we ought to be able to do. Some of you have been called to specific ministry. Praise God for that. But one of the things we hear a lot is, well, I can't do that. I'm just an ordinary person. Well, he is still the same extraordinary Savior who can give you authority. Look what it says in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13. He gave some as apostles. He then gave some as prophets. He's giving as evangelists. He's giving as pastors, giving as teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the service, to building up the body of Christ until all of us attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. This isn't just for some, it's for all to develop in the maturity and the stature that is consistent with the fullness of Christ. It's still not asking very much, and it's what the Lord wants. And you'll find this, if you're willing to push past the doubts that you have about your ordinariness, and if you're willing to step out in faith in the extraordinariness of Christ, you can do every one of these things that he's asked you to do. And you'll take delight in every one of these things that he's asked you to do. Because he's not desiring to send you out weak. He didn't send these folks out weak. That was a year's worth of training at the feet of Christ to then go out and do these things. He doesn't want to send you out weak, but he wants to send you out. He doesn't want you to go out weak. He wants you to go with authority. And the Bible makes it very clear. He gives that authority. Advancing the faith with authority. Here's the second thing we see. Advancing the faith with assurance. Verses 8 through 12. Christ tells them to take almost nothing with them. This is great. Take a staff. That's fine. You can take some shoes. That's good. You can take one shirt. Don't take two. Uh, no food. No money. Don't take any money. And then we've got to do these things I've asked you to do. Matthew and Luke make it clear that they're to go out and tell people the kingdom of God is coming. 
And if they reject that message of the kingdom of God, yeah, kick the dust off your sandals. Because they, as it says in the, the later Gospels, it would be easier for them and better for them on the day of judgment if they were from that town called Sodom and Gomorrah. If they were part of that group of Sodom and Gomorrah, it would be easier for them on judgment day than if they reject the gospel that Christ is giving them to share. All of the miracle powers, the raising of the dead and the uh, healing sick people and the casting out demons, why has Jesus been doing this? He's made it clear, to share the gospel. That's the point. That's the key, the gospel. And now he's telling his people, do all of these things, get their attention, but share the gospel. What they will be rejected for is if they reject the gospel. By the way, uh, they're not going to be treated well. Jesus makes that clear, especially in Matthew's gospel. This is going to be difficult. He says it's, it's sort of the continuing thing of your work is you're like sheep sent out amongst wolves. You've got to be crafty like a serpent, pure like a dove. They're going to beat you. They're going to persecute you. They're going to take you before officials. They're going to kick you out of their cities. But Matthew says this in chapter 10, verses 19 and 20. But when they do hand you over, don't worry about how or what you're going to say. It'll be given to you in that hour what you are to say. It's not you who speak. It's the spirit of your father who speaks in you. Oh, praise God. How about that assurance? This is going to be really tough. This is going to be really painful at times. You're going to get hurt in the process, but I'm going to be with you. I'm going to, be with you. I'm going to tell you what to say because that gospel is going to be shared. And even though it's going to be painful, it's going to be shared and you're going to share it. What about the part about being broke that he talked about earlier? Does that mean we need to sell everything and go live in a ditch? No, that's right. Someone's like, I got a game station at home, preacher. Don't tell them to get rid of that game station. <laughs> no, we don't. We, this is not to be. And here, I'll show you why. Because in Luke's gospel, in chapter 22, verse 35 and 36, so way beyond this, look what he says. I love this. This is, this is Jesus calls them together and says, hey, remember this time? I, this is great. He says, he said to them, you know when I sent you out without money, without that money belt, without a bag, without sandals, you didn't lack anything, did you? You remember that? Remember I said, what would that have seemed like? Hey, uh, go into these cities, they don't like you, and they might you know, try to kill you or take you before the authorities. Certainly probably going to beat you, and, been, and they may reject what you say. Oh, by the way, don't take any money with you, or food, or change of clothes. Jesus said, hey, remember that time? Remember that time we don't, and, and you didn't take it? You didn't lack, did you? They said, no, we didn't lack for anything. He goes on and says, then he said to them, but now whoever has a money belt, go ahead and take it along with you. Likewise, also the bag, go ahead and take the money with you. You may need to buy a sword. Maybe you need to sell your coat and get a sword. You might have to kill for your food. You can eat now. Go ahead, eat, eat, knock yourself out, eat. Or you might need to defend yourself too. But remember that time though, that I sent you out with nothing other than the assurance that I would be with you and you didn't lack anything, did you? Lord, you want me to go and speak to my coworker about Jesus? You want me to go to school and tell my friends at school who Jesus is? You want me to go with my friends who don't like you at all and say anything about you? Lord, I'm just an ordinary person. Jesus, look, I'm going to give you the words if you're faithful to go. I'm going to give you the assurance that I'm going to be with you when you go. And I'm arming you with the power of the gospel that can change their lives. Now go. You know, there are a lot of attempted assurances for you to work now, right? You know, if you, if you want to work, you, the power is, boy, you got power. Man, they're giving signing bonuses at McDonald's, which I'm thrilled about. I want happy McDonald's workers because I love their food. I'm not afraid to say it. I'm not ashamed to say it. A lot of people say, oh, I don't go to McDonald's. Yes, you do. You don't want anyone to know you do, but it's good food. <laughs> it doesn't matter what McDonald's you go to, where it is, it's the same good food. Whatever that they shoot into those burgers, to whatever, it's good. And when I get my quarter pounder with cheese plain, as every hamburger should be made, I want it to be from a happy worker. And so if they need a signing bonus to be happy, great. If I need to throw another quarter onto the charge of that quarter pounder with cheese plain, I will do it. And if they need a signing bonus, give them a signing bonus. Went to Quick Trip the other day. My poor, sick wife, we were in Charlotte. My, she, she managed to get out of the house and go see Jordan's wedding dress and was not feeling good at all. She's not been able to eat a lot. She's just been, it's just been a mess. But she said, you know what I'd like? I'd like a pretzel. Well, baby, I'm going to get you a pretzel. 
this man will hunt down a pretzel. If you like a man in the old days, like out in the wilderness hunting for food, this man in the jungle of Charlotte will find you a hot pretzel because he is a man. And there's a quick trip nearby. So I hunt into that quick trip. I brave the cold weather, walk from my car to that quick trip and say, let's get this woman a pretzel. And you know what they said? We don't have enough staff. We can't make you a pretzel. You mean there's nobody here that can turn a microwave on? You can't make a, nope, no staff. Did you pray? <laughs> Did I pray? <laughs> I probably should have. I probably should have. I walked out of there. I had to go back to my wife, pretzel-less. They need signing bonus, people. Whatever it takes to get people to work, we need to get them to work. The power is in the worker. In, in the Christian faith, uh, the power is only in the worker if Christ is in the worker. And the assurance is not the benefits. What are the benefits? What do I get? What do I get? What do I get? I get the benefit of giving the glory to God. And as a Christian, that's what I want. That's what I want. The benefit I want is that Christ received the glory. The benefit that I want is that I get the blessing of serving him. And the power that I have is because he gives it to me. So the assurance is Christ is going to be with me in any of these situations. I talked to a pastor on Saturday. He said, here's what people are saying the church of the postmodern or the post-COVID church will look like. He had got this from some group. I'm, I'll give you the information. It's 30, 40, 30. He said 30% of the people just won't come back. They won't come back. And they're just not going to see him again. Now, we haven't seen that at Lee Park. At Anderson Grove, actually 100% have, that number is 100%. It's exactly what it was before COVID. At Lee Park, we're about 90% what we wore, wore before COVID. Now, not today because it's, it's a time change. And so people, the only thing worse than rain to a Baptist is setting your clock up an hour. So... <laughs> The 9 o'clock service, we actually, the chapel was good today. The 9 o'clock service was, I mean, surprisingly good today. And look at y'all. You, 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 you slept in. You 9 o'clock people slept in. You 11 o'clock people, maybe a little groggy. Maybe catching up on that hour now. I don't know. But you're, you're, uh, <laughs> but you're here, and that's good. So we've seen, we've seen we're better than average. We've seen a lot of our people come back, and throughout the church family, we're seeing a lot of those people come back. So that's good. So that's good. But 30%, most churches expect they will never come back. Now, there's this, 40% will return, but not consistently. So what it's saying is that 40% will return the way they used to be. And by the way, the way they, they started to categorize a consistent church member is if you came 1.6 times a month. That's now, in our world today, that's considered an active church member. So 40%... We'll go back to coming maybe twice a month, maybe twice a month. Unless it's cold, unless it's raining, unless I got a game to watch, unless I got something, unless I'm tired and sick, whatever it is. And then 30% will have a renewed passion for the work. Now, he gave me this as a way to be depressing. But I tell you what, I went to that last number and said, praise God. Because it's always been said 20% of the people do 80% of the work. If we're up 10% in workload and work desire and workforce, if we went from 20% to 30% who are actually passionate about the work, praise God. We can do with the 40% that kind of here or there or whatever. If we've got 30% who are ready to go and the assurance of God is that he'll be with them as they go, maybe that's you. Maybe you're coming to church more now than you ever did. Maybe you're reading your Bible now more than you ever did. Maybe you now see the uniqueness of the gathering of the people of God on the Lord's day in the Lord's house, and maybe you're committed to it, and you're doing it more consistently because you've got some renewed passion in you that now things are opening back up. You've seen the darkness of the world, and you want the light of Christ. And if that's you, praise God. Because what you'll find every step in your growing, maturing faith is that Christ will be with you. And when you do these challenging things for the faith, he'll give you the assurance that he's right there with you. Praise God. Here's the third thing. We'll be finished. Advancing the faith with accomplishments. Okay, verse 13 is a really cool verse. And, and if you've got your Bible still open, I want you to jump to chapter, uh, stay there, but go to verses 30 and 32 with me. I'm going to get there in just a second. Because what Mark does here is kind of a, what we call a Mark sandwich. Mark does this a lot. He'll start a story, 
Then he'll put another story in the middle of it, then finish the story. So he started the story here, and then the story he put in the middle we're going to look at next week. But then later he adds this. But here's, here's what's happening. They come back in verse 13, and they get to tell Jesus what happened. Jesus calls them together, and they get together with Jesus and talk about, here's what we accomplished. Can you imagine how cool that would be? That they, they, they got, and, and here's what Jesus does. Look at this in, in verse 30 of Mark chapter 6. So the apostles gathered together with Jesus, and they reported to him all that they had done and taught. Oh, my goodness. And he said to them, come away by yourselves to a secluded place and rest a while. And he's so good. For there were many people coming and going, and they didn't even have time to eat. So they went away in a boat to a secluded place by themselves, and they rested. There will come a day, by the way, when he's finished with me being here on this earth, and he's ready for me to be in heaven. And by his grace, by my faith in Christ, I'll be there. I'll be there. And the Bible says that I'm going to get to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into your place of rest. Rest. Can you imagine? Good job. Good job, guys. You did it, didn't you? You did, didn't have food, didn't have, you had a staff and a tunic, and that was it, some sandals. But you were armed with the power of the gospel. You had authority over sickness and demons and death, which opened the door for you to present that the kingdom of God is here. You did it. Now rest. In fact, there's so many people around, let's, let's get away. Let's get away and rest. Sunday is my favorite day of the week. Favorite day of the week. Because I, I'm, I am called to pastor this church and I'm thankful to do it. On Sunday, I get to do what I am passionate about. And that is to follow the calling to open the Word of God and study the Word of God and then gather together with you and deliver the Word of God. That's the coolest job in the world. I love Sunday. I love to get to do this with you. I, I just I, It's my favorite day of the week to get to do this. And um, I get to talk to people. I, sometimes I'm in and out of some churches. I don't get to stop at Anderson Grove very long. But, but like after the chapel, I get to talk to people. Before the 9 o'clock service, I get to talk to people. Afterwards, I'll get to talk to you all. When, when uh, whoever closes the service comes up and does that, I'll head out to the lobby and I'll be by the front door while they're praying. I'll walk out and I'll be there to say hey to you, get to talk to you if you want to talk. For some of you, it'll be a time to share things that you're sad about. And a part of the ministry is that I be there for that. Some of you will share the things you're excited about. And I'll get to join in that excitement. Some of you will come out and say, that's the best sermon I've ever heard anyone preach in the history of the world. And I'll say, amen. So, <laughs> but, but I'll, we'll get to share in that together. And I love it. I love it. Then I'll go home and I'll have lunch and I will take a nap. <sighs> it's the best nap ever. Sunday naps. Oh, man. How many people get a Sunday nap? You get a Sunday nap? Yeah. Oh, isn't it just the best nap ever? I don't sleep a lot. And so you can imagine last night when I'm up and suddenly it doesn't go to 2 o'clock. It goes from 159 to 3. And I'm like, oh, I got to be up in a couple hours here. And I haven't even gone to bed yet. So that was tough. But I am going to be asleep in a couple hours. I mean, a really good sleep, too. I'm going to sit there. My mother-in-law is staying with us now. She'll come out. We'll talk about the sermon. And she's very, very smart biblically. We'll go through the, the Bible and go through the sermon. And we'll watch it. I probably won't stay awake during it. But, but it'll, I'll just, oh, four hours later, I will wake up. And I will just be in. I'll be one with the couch. You know what I mean? That kind of sleep. That, like you become the cushion. That kind of sleep. And it is the absolute best sleep. It's just this rest of, just a re for me, it's a reminder, good job. Maybe you did it as well this week. Maybe you didn't do it this well, but at least you did it. You opened the Bible. You, you, you gave them the Bible. You preached the Bible. Now, now, now rest. Because, you know, Monday, you know, back to the grind, right? I mean, for you, not me. I only work one day a week. But for you, <laughs> back to the grind. But that day of rest, oh, I thank the Lord for it. That, that Sunday afternoon nap. And I, and I, I thank Him for the confidence I think I'm thankful for the authority 
that by His grace He gives that I get to open up this and preach it. I thank, I'm thankful for the assurance that He gives me that His Word is true and His gospel is powerful. And, and I am thankful for the accomplishments that He and I get to celebrate together. Because while I don't see Him physically, I can pray to Him and I can thank Him for a really good day. And I can thank Him for allowing me to get up and do what I just did. And then I can rest in the knowledge of who He is. Mm. This being a Christian thing is pretty good. If you're not a Christian, I hope today by faith you trust Him. Serving Christ is good. And if you're sort of wondering if maybe it's time for you to really step out and be in that 30%, it is, it's time. It's really good. And if this whole church thing is new to you, then take confidence in the assurance that He's with you, even in this growing time for you. And He loves you very much. Stand with me. Let's close with a word of prayer. God, thank you for this great gathering of people. I'm, I'm so thankful that they're here. For those who are watching online, I know some still are not well. I, I pray that you'd be with my wife and, and help her get past this lingering thing that she's dealing with. And for those who are home today and watching, God, I'm thankful for the ways that we can reach them through this technology. And God, I, I pray that, um, that these are your people would get exactly what they need to get from you. I don't know all of their needs, but you do. For some of them, they need to be comforted today. And I'm thankful you're the, you're the great comforter. Some of them need to be challenged today. Some of them need to be convicted today. And you'll do that very, very well. And some need confidence today that you are with them. You've given them the authority of the gospel to share. And you'll be with them. And God, how they need to respond now, that's also between you and them. Some will want to come and pray and praise God for that. Some maybe today are ready to, by faith, trust Christ as their Lord and Savior. And they want to come talk to somebody about that. Praise God. Maybe some are ready to join or be baptized. Whatever it is, God, I just pray that they be faithful and move now as you instruct. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.